northeast of France. Russia is the state of the Empire. Vienna is the capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Russian Empire is ruled by the Tsar. <laughs> and the Americas were involved, and almost everyone on Earth was affected by it. This is a survey of one phase of that war, its effect on the United States. Europe, 1914. Although its history and geography were studied in American schools, Europe seemed far away to most Americans in the days when ships were the only way to get across the Atlantic. To most Americans, the problems of Europe seemed as remote as the continent itself. Since the days of Washington and Jefferson, the United States had held to a policy of no entangling alliances with European nations. There was indifference to the growing militarism and imperialism of the great powers of Europe as they competed for world markets and raw materials for new industries. European nations had seized land in many parts of the world. Most of Africa, for instance, had been occupied during the previous half century. British colonies provided raw materials for English industries and a market for English goods. The French, keeping pace with the British, had moved into North Africa to ensure their food supply. Germany, a latecomer, was fighting for its share of world trade and demanding fuller recognition as a world power. Bitterness grew as the great powers of Europe built up huge armies and formed into two hostile camps. Each nation pledged to fight if any of its allies were attacked. One alliance included Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy, called the Triple Alliance. Opposing them was the Triple Entente of France, Russia, and England. These complex tensions finally exploded into war. The crisis began in June 1914, when Serbian patriots in Bosnia shot and killed the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, then visiting the capital, Sarajevo. As news was flashed by overseas cables, each day's headlines kept the crisis immediate and alive for the American public. By August 1914, the great powers of Europe were at war, the Central Powers against the Allies. The German plan was to overwhelm France, then turn its full force on Russia. To reach France, Germany decided to march through neutral Belgium. When Belgium resisted, Germany let loose its guns on that small nation. Most Americans were shocked at what was labeled the rape of Belgium. But America remained behind its traditional wall of isolation. Most Americans sincerely wanted to stay neutral, even though many were recent immigrants from Europe and still felt strong ties to former homelands now fighting in the war. The burden of defining American neutrality fell to the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. At the war's start, he called upon Americans to be neutral in fact as well as in name, in thought as well as in action. The Allied powers were trying to blockade Germany, both on land and at sea, to deny her necessary war supplies. 
Germany was trying to starve England by destroying her shipping with a new weapon, the submarine. Early in the war, the British Navy cut off Germany from her colonies and swept German ships off the surface of the sea. Britain impounded the cargoes of neutral ships, including those of the United States, if they were bound for German ports. Wilson protested to Britain and protested also against a German threat to torpedo any ships found in British waters. Then, as so often happens, a single incident occurred which profoundly stirred American opinion. The British luxury liner, the Lusitania, sailed from New York in May 1915. In spite of German warnings, its passenger list included many Americans. A German submarine sighted the Lusitania off the coast of Ireland. Hit without warning, the Lusitania exploded and sank so fast that the loss of life was appalling. More than 1,200 dead, 128 of them Americans. American reaction was overwhelming. The New York Times accused the Germans of making war like savages drunk with blood. But some claimed that the unusually fast sinking was due to the explosion of a secret cargo of American-made munitions bound for Britain. The Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, held that British interference with American shipping was fully as unbearable as German submarine warfare. When Wilson sent a sharp protest to Germany, without also protesting to Britain, Bryan resigned from the cabinet. But the United States was still legally neutral, and Wilson hoped it could act as mediator to end the war. In the middle of 1915, he sent his aide, Colonel House, to Europe as his personal envoy. The situation at Colonel House there gave hope that the warring powers would consider a peace with honor. In spite of heavy losses, I'd had been able to make decisive gains. Italy had deserted its former alliance and was now at war against Germany, while Turkey had entered on the side of Germany. On the vast Russian front, the Germans were winning. But on the Western front, across Northeast France, the gigantic armies were deadlocked. Their trenches faced each other across a bleakness called no man's land. To break this deadlock of the trenches, many devices of war were introduced or developed. Barbed wire to protect trenches. Poison gas on the gas mask. Armored tanks with guns. Observation balloons for directing long-range artillery fire. And the airplane as a military weapon with the first aerial dogfight, then the first bombing raid, and the devastating barrage of big guns. In the battles of Verdun and of the Somme in 1916, there were almost two million casualties, yet neither side won a decisive victory. No Man's Land became a symbol of the First World War's devastation. It was this kind of destruction that Woodrow Wilson wanted to end. In 1916, Wilson ran for re-election on a platform of peace. His party slogan was, he kept us out of war. His re-election reflected the wish of most Americans to stay out of what many still felt was Europe's war. After re-election, Wilson continued his efforts to rally world opinion behind his concept of a just peace. Peace without victory. Victory would mean peace forced upon the loser.
a victor's terms forced upon the vanquished, leaving a sting, a resentment, a bitter memory, upon which terms of peace would rest not permanently, but only upon quicksand. But the warring powers did not want peace without victory. Britain still hoped that her blockade would defeat Germany. Her battleships patrolled the open sea. German submarines, on the other hand, had sunk thousands of British ships. More than 5,000 British ships were sunk during the entire war. There were German successes on land, too. The British effort to complete the encirclement of Germany by occupying the Middle East was defeated by the Turks at Gallipoli. The Germans conquered Romania in a few weeks. There were smashing victories on the Eastern Front. Russia was beginning to collapse from the internal strife that later led to revolution. Italy, too, was beginning to weaken, but the British blockade was proving effective. Germany, desperately working against time, decided to risk renewal of unrestricted submarine warfare. In violation of traditional international law, the step was taken with full knowledge that it might cause a break and possible war with the United States. During one month, March 1917, five American ships were sunk. Cut off from Germany by the British blockade, American trade with the Allies had grown, and American prosperity had become increasingly linked to the Allied cause. The sinkings shocked the American people. War sentiment grew. It was increased by the discovery in March 1917 that the Kaiser's government had asked the aid of Mexico in case of war with the United States. On April 2nd, 1917, Wilson appeared before Congress to declare that German actions had created a state of war between the United States and Germany. The present German submarine warfare against commerce is a warfare against mankind. The world must be made safe for democracy. Congress declared war on April 6th. Now the United States began the great conversion to war. It had almost no army at all by European standards and set out to build one. The first step was a draft law, which eventually called some three million young men into service. The United States was faced with an unprecedented problem, raising and equipping an army to be sent across the Atlantic and sending vast amounts of war equipment and supplies to the Allies across the sea. Patriotic feeling was never higher. All over the country, people rallied to support the war, buying liberty bonds, contributing to the Red Cross and other relief. Wilson set forth American war aims for all the world to know. We shall fight for democracy, for the things we have always carried nearest our hearts, for the rights and liberties of small nations, for a universal dominion of right, to make the world itself at last free. As food and goods of war began to flow across the Atlantic on a scale never before seen in history, a powerful psychological weapon was also launched. Woodrow Wilson's 14-point plan for a just peace. Open covenants openly arrived at. Freedom of the seas. Reduction of armaments. Equality of trade for all nations. Restoration of Belgium. Self-determination of peoples with independence and freedom for all. And perhaps most important, a League of Nations to prevent future wars. 
Wilson's 14 points demonstrated the power and importance of morale in war. His plan nourished peace sentiment in Germany and Austria that may have hastened their eventual collapse. Not till the spring of 1918 were American troops ready to go overseas in great numbers. This was the American Expeditionary Force, the AEF, the first American army to fight across the Atlantic. As millions watched anxiously, the United States sent out through submarine-infested waters the biggest fighting force ever to leave its shores. In all, more than two million men were transported, with the loss at sea held to 758 most of them from one ship. To get troop ships safely to France, British and American fleets developed convoy tactics that at last countered much of the effectiveness of the submarine. Lookouts kept watch for signs of the undersea raiders. An alarm brought gunfire and depth charge. In addition, an Allied mine barrier across the North Sea hindered German submarines from entering and leaving their ports. Under command of General John J. Pershing, the doughboys of the AEF, as they were called, began to arrive in France. Their battle cry was, Lafayette, we are here. It brought new life to the nearly exhausted French. But before the full weight of American aid could be felt, the Germans launched an offensive designed to end the war. Everything appeared to be in their favor. In October 1917, the Italian army cracked up and the Austrians poured out onto the plains of northern Italy. In November and December, Russian resistance collapsed and a Russia torn by revolution asked for peace. Romania had been knocked out of the war. The British offensive in the Near East had failed. Perhaps most dangerous of all, the submarine warfare seemed to be winning, and England was in danger of starvation. In the spring of 1917, the German armies launched what they hoped would be the decisive offensive against the Allies in northern France. In March 1918, they struck at Amiens. In April, at least. In May, June, and July, they came within artillery range of Paris itself. But the Allied lines held and American troops saw their first large-scale fighting. The 1st Division at Cantigny, the 2nd at Chateau Thierry, the 3rd at Belleau Wood, the 42nd, the 28th, the 32nd and others fighting at tiny French villages and along streams whose names the soldiers could hardly pronounce. By July 17, 1918, Unable to maintain the offensive against fresh and hopeful Allied troops, the last German advance came to a halt. Meanwhile, the Allied buildup was underway, with Americans under the Allied commander, Marshal Foch of France. Foch's plan to give the exhausted Germans no rest. On July 18th, the counterattack began, preceded by the usual artillery barrage. Americans fought under Allied commanders with seasoned Allied troops to reduce the German force in the Aisne Marne sector. American equipment and material were in use throughout the front. American soldiers and equipment were now pouring into France. In August 1918, 
Marshal Foch granted Pershing's demand for an independent American army in the field, and the American First Army was formed. Its objectives, to reduce the enemy sector at San Miguel, then move north to join other Allied forces in the reduction of the Meuse Argonne. The American troops gained their objectives. They were well supplied, well commanded, and above all, they were fresh and eager. With the flow of American supplies, the balance was now tipped in favor of the Allies. Germany decided to give up before its army was entirely destroyed. Their allies, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Austria-Hungary, had already surrendered. The Kaiser abdicated and Germany asked for an armistice. On November 11th, 1918, at 11 o'clock in the morning, the war ended. Not only for those who lived under the Stars and Stripes, but for all the warring nations throughout the world. Men on both sides had given their lives for causes they believed in. The dead, more than eight million soldiers. 126,000 were Americans. Joyous celebrations everywhere greeted the armistice. In this war, the United States had learned how to mobilize its vast strength into a major fighting force, and had learned too that the Atlantic Ocean was no longer a barrier to modern armies. The nations of Europe had seen at first hand the impressive potential power of the United States. The war had established the United States as a leader in the community of nations, a role from which it could never fully withdraw. Through Woodrow Wilson, the United States was also thrust into the moral leadership of the world. For Wilson had promised that this would be a war to end wars, a war to make the world safe for democracy. He himself, with a large staff, sailed for France for the peace conference at Versailles to try to make good these promises. Wilson arrived in France in December 1918. There he was besieged by the people whose hearts he had stirred. There is a great tide running in the hearts of men the hearts of men have never beaten so singularly in unison before. Men have never been so conscious of their brotherhood. Before the peace conference, Wilson visited England and Italy. Everywhere he was hailed by vast crowds. He and the democracy of which he was president had become a symbol of hope to Europe's people. A groundswell rose among the people of the world as the leaders of the great powers gathered at Versailles for the peace conference. With his capacity to interpret the aspirations of people throughout the world, Wilson was the acknowledged leader of this conference. Its working chairman was the French statesman Clemenceau. The main responsibility for setting the terms of the peace was born by the Council of Four. Here, next to Wilson, stands Clemenceau. Beside him is Orlando of Italy, and next to him the British war leader David Lloyd George. These three men had spent their lives dealing with the kinds of pressures and interests that had brought on the war, and they were not ready to accept the views of Woodrow Wilson, president of a nation with no territorial ambition. We are here to see that the very foundations of this war are swept away. Those foundations were the private choice of a small coterie of civil rulers and military staffs. The aggression of great powers upon the small. The holding together of empires of unwilling subjects by the duress of arms. 
After months of discussion and controversy, as the world stood anxiously by, the Versailles Treaty was completed and signed by Germany in June 1919. It was not the peace without victory that Wilson had envisioned, but it contained the one provision Wilson thought most essential, the founding of a League of Nations to provide the machinery for international cooperation. But the United States Senate still had to ratify the treaty and the League. Wilson explained the League to his people this way. My conception of the League of Nations is just this that it shall operate as the organized moral force of men throughout the world, and that wherever wrong and aggression are planned or contemplated, this searching light of conscience will be turned upon them, and men everywhere will ask, what are the purposes you hold in your heart against the fortunes of the world? Although a majority of the Senate voted for ratifying the Versailles Treaty, Wilson was unable to get the necessary two-thirds vote. The League of Nations met, but was repudiated by Wilson's own government. For many Americans were not yet ready to accept the position of world leadership which the war had thrust upon the United States. As Europe searched for a way to dig itself out of the ruins of the war, the United States returned to its traditional policy of isolation. But a new generation of American school children, as they studied the revised map of Europe, could no longer think of it as very remote from the United States. Czechoslovakia is now a republic whose capital is Prague. The town of Sarajevo now lies in the center of Yugoslavia. Danzig is now a free city at the head of the Polish corridor. <laughs> <laughs>